Hey there, welcome to the Flute 360 podcast. I'm Dr. Heidi K. Begay, and I'm a flutist, educator, coach, and podcaster. My God given mission is to serve you. I am passionate about guiding you, the modern day flutist, to discover your unique voice on and off the stage. The goal of this podcast is to help you thrive both as an artist and as a musicpreneur. Go ahead and grab some espresso, your favorite notepad, and let's get to it. Today's episode 206 is titled, Your Voice Matters with Jean-Paul Wright. So Jean-Paul Wright and I were just talking about podcasting and it's kind of funny because a week ago, right, Jean-Paul, we were yeah. talking pre-recording like, what does an episode do when you have two podcast hosts who leads? <laughs> so in this <laughs> virtual dance, we're going to be both of us kind of leading and taking and yeah, and all that. <laughs> I wish is, this on, we, is this on video as well? <laughs> are we going to do video? Because <laughs> y'all have got to see Jean-Paul right now. He is fabulous. <laughs> But no, this is amazing. This is an amazing collaboration. And Jean-Paul is the podcast host of Talking Flutes through Trevor James. And I'm Heidi through Flutes 360. And we've decided to collaborate. And we've decided to do a crossover because we found out that there's a lot of parallels between his world and my world when it comes to podcasting. And we are getting super excited about, you know, the future of podcasting and inviting you, the listener, into this space of potentially you having your own podcast. So good morning or good afternoon, Jean-Paul. How are you? Uh, Good afternoon, Heidi. And good afternoon, if you're listening or watching. I'm very well. And you're exactly right. We were talking a week ago about, and we're, we're in the 200s now, which that's a lot of podcasts, and that is over a number of years. Um, but the the essence of podcasting isn't necessarily what people think it is. It is creating something that is unique. And let's face it, as we were speaking, we've all got a unique voice. Whether you are a new learner or whether you're an established professional, you've got a voice. Mm. And that voice can po- be portrayed through podcasts. Mm. And how you're thinking, how you're developing – Everything is valid. And I think we were, we were talking about that. And you were saying, absolutely. And I know you teach and you help people mm. set up their own podcasts. Whether, whereas, whereas me, I have a day job and I do podcasting for fun. But you're the one that guides people through the processes. Yeah, I was thinking about that last night and this morning as I was mentally preparing for our talk. And I think the reason why I'm so passionate about teaching podcasting specifically to musicians is because it has transformed my world in Mm. so many ways. And it not only gave me a wonderful terminal degree because Flutes 360 actually started off as my dissertation, but since then it's evolved into a resume builder as a hobby. And now it's a marketing arm on to my company. It's shining a light onto who I am as a brand. And the podcast has been like probably one of the biggest blessings of my life. Not only has it connected me with wonderful people from across the globe, like yourself, whom quite honestly, I don't know if I would have ever met said person. I don't, I mean, like I could have met you at an NFA convention, but would we have had the luxury of sitting down for 40 minutes to pick each other's brains. Maybe not. It would, it would have been in passing and it would have been like, oh, there's Jean Paul Wright. That's so cool. And then you would have been whizzing off to the next thing or myself included. So I get to meet phenomenal people, right? Like flute is from Finland. I have flute students in Finland, in California, in Australia because of my podcast, right? And not just that, but then how I've developed as a person And as a musician, so full circle, this is why I want musicians to know that of the two of the six podcasters sitting here today, we are inviting you into this space. And the reason being is, at least for me, my musical voice has soared because of podcasting. Before I would have the worst performance anxiety 
Jean-Paul, the worst. The flute would be shaking, you know, on my face. I couldn't hold it still because I was always worried about what are they thinking? Is my voice or are my ideas through the flute valid? But when you sit behind a microphone week after week, and you have to articulate your ideas and have somewhat, I'm not always perfect, but have a somewhat valid thought from beginning, middle to end, and be able to articulate it with confidence through my spoken English voice. When I put my musical flute voice to my face and share it with my audience, oh my goodness, the transformation has been astounding. So it goes back to that magic word that you keep on referring to, which is voice. And the uniqueness of everybody listening to this who has a, a verbal voice where we enunciate our vowels and we sort of speak our consonants and we create we, these wonderful words. And we all use words in a different pattern. And we all speak in the course of a day. We all speak to our friends. But when we play on the stage, we, we're told to create the rapport with the audience. And a lot of people find that quite hard because, as you said, performance anxiety kicks in and you're hiding behind the music stand and you're hiding behind the notes and the narrative of the music doesn't really take over and come out to the audience. But you're exactly right with podcasting because as soon as you can speak into a microphone, listen to your voice and say, OK, it isn't what I expected it to be, but it is, after a few weeks, it transcends other parts of your life. The confidence builds up and you are exactly right in that it becomes a vehicle for change either within or externally, depending on the message you're wanting to get out. I love that. Yes. And that segues beautifully into a question that I wanted to ask you. Now, you with your podcast, there's a lot of parallels, I think, between your podcasting world and my podcasting world, but I think that there are, are also uh, differences as well. You were extremely well more established in your career before you started podcasting. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because now that you've added a podcast further into your career, have you noticed similar changes within your own playing or your career? Like, how has podcasting affected you? But this actually helped me in various different ways. I love public speaking. And one of my passions, I think we spoke about in our preamble last week, was speaking about meditation and speaking about creative visualization. And normally I would have to go onto the stage with a mind map and I'd create, I'd go around my presentation using a mind map so I wouldn't have notes. Now, I'm quite happy to go onto a stage without any notes and let my mind take me where I want to take me. And I didn't have that four years ago. I was very much note driven because public speaking and let's speak, let's face it, speaking into a microphone isn't. Well, I suppose it is public speaking, but mm. it's not because you are still hidden behind the microphone. We don't have to have a visual reference that we do here. Hmm. And for me, it was finding that voice and saying, OK, listening back, I can understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I need to slow down, not be as excitable. But I can mm. then move that into my speaking. And students can do that if they're at university and need to do a presentation. Having got involved in podcasting and understanding what their voice sounds like enables them to just take a little step back Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not mean to cut you off. That was my visual cue of, yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally resonate with that, with like what their voice sounds like. Now, are you talking specifically about their spoken voice or their musical voice? Just to I clarify. Think initially spoken voice. Yeah. But spoken voice then transcends into their instrumental voice. I could not agree more. And that's the thing that I'm like preaching from the rooftops because the minute I became comfortable in my own spoken voice, knowing, because before I would hide behind my quirks, my quirks are, I'm a talker. And you and I talked about that last week. We are both known to our friends and families as being the talker in the group. I knew this about myself, but I saw it as a negative aspect of my personality. I knew that like me talking a mile a minute when I get really excited and super loud, I thought that was, again, a negative characteristic. Come to find out, I was diminishing those characteristics. 
I was saying, no, I have to be a certain way. I have to be more. I don't know why I had this idea. Maybe because you're behind a microphone and you think it's more formal or official. I felt like I had to be a certain way, like hands under my tush and, you know, tie and be very prim and proper. But what I found out was by doing that, I was not having fun. I was not articulating my ideas well. I was being somebody else because I thought I had to be. Then the minute I unleashed from this bottle, unleashed my talkative personality, my excitement, my loud voice, my Chicago nasally voice. <laughs> I know a lot of my vows are like, eh, you know, and it's not you know the most pleasant thing, but it is what it is. The minute I tapped into just being who I was and allowing myself to showcase that to my people, to the world, oh my goodness, like then I knew going into my musical voice, I was asking myself, like, what characteristics am I hiding behind? Right? Like, what am I not showing on the stage? Because I think I have to be a certain way. And oh my goodness, I uncovered a lot. So yes, I just wanted to piggyback off of what you said about like once students or professionals or amateurs realize like their actual spoken voice, their characteristics, their quirks, what makes them them, then it trans beautifully into the flute voice. It does. And let's face it, the flute voice is the most important thing with the instrument. Anybody can play fast. And I will say that to anyone. I, I love hearing people do encores and playing fast, but I can listen to them for three or four minutes. What I want is for people to make the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Mm. When I listen to a podcast, I want to listen. I listen with a different type of picture. I become involved in that person. I become involved in their voice. And then that voice then takes me on a little journey to find out, oh, they're musicians. What do they do? How do they play? And being a life learner, for me, it is understanding what makes other people tick and other people understand themselves. Oh my goodness. I love learning what makes people tick. I recorded two episodes last night for a health series that I'm doing with Austin Pantsner. And I always say to every one of my guests, I am ready to pick your brain. I will try to be really soft and gentle, but I love picking brains. I love seeing what makes people uh, thrive and tick and why they're passionate within their niche. I love understanding their process, how they get from like point A to point B, all of that. So yes, I couldn't agree more. And that process is the same whether you are me or you, or whether you're a new student of the flute at university, at college, or whether you're a student, or if you're another musician, we all have that process. We all have our unique developmental journey. Mm. And that it's, unless you can find your own voice in that journey, you really can't develop into who you really are. And we go back to podcasting again. I think I've always been a chatterer. I've always been what somebody that will change my voice, you know, get a London voice on. I would do daft things, you know. I've got a podcast account called The Little Red Cup. Not podcast account. I've got an Instagram account called The Little Red Cup. Who talks like this? Londonish. You know, I will mess around because... It's taken me a long time to find out who I was. And when my flute playing, my earlier career, my flute playing, I very much was a follower and a copier. And mm. I never really, I was never told to sort of find out who I was as a musician. And I would try, the worst thing I ever did, and I, when my co-host Claire Southworth, I, we spoke about this. My, one of my worst traits was, is when I was sent home and had to do the, one of the TNGs, I had to do something else, uh, one of the pieces. Oh, yeah. Ebear second movement. Mm. The Ebear second movement, I had to go and do that uh, and pra practice that for the next lesson. And I went in and James Dow, my beautiful teacher in London, said, you've been listening to Ellen Marion play that, haven't you? And I went, how do you know? And he said, "That's Al he said you're not Ellen Marion and you'll never, ever play it as good as Ellen Marion. Who is Jean-Paul? Mm. And that was really the key who I was as a musician. And what mm. podcasting has done is enabled me to sort of speak to people and understand that actually everybody goes through this process. Everybody struggles with knowing who they are. And why not? Why not podcast yourself away? Yes. Oh, my goodness. I love it. And I love something that you said. You said that 
you wanted to, I cannot imitate it because I am horrible with accents, but you wanted to experiment with like this deep English accent. What would that sound like, you know, and how does that feel and tapping into who you are? Yeah. It's like, again, kind of going back to my world, you know, as being a talker, I love talking with my hands. Right. And again, I'm very expressive. I'm very passionate when I talk about some things that I love, right? Same thing on the stage. Like I was withholding that. I was withholding movement. I was withholding that expression in my face. So because of podcasting, circling back to what you said, because of podcasting, I get to experiment with the tone of my voice, the pace of my voice, the volume of my voice, whether I want to really like elongate a word just for the heck of it. What would it feel like if I was just silent and you and I just sat here for five seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds in silence? What would that feel like? And being okay with all of that, because that's what we do on the stage, is it not? And that goes back to how you almost started at the beginning, which was the relationship building And as musicians, we need to build a relationship with the audience. And with podcasters, we need to build a relationship with the audience. Hmm. And there's correlations between them both because a lot of people hide behind the stand. They hide behind the notes because they're paralyzed with fear of measure, their fear of criticism, their fear of lack of perfection. And the relationship between them and the audience is then you have a, a barrier goes up. And what podcast enables you to do, if you don't record it in as a video, to talk. Hmm. And there is no barrier. It's just you. And then everything you say becomes valid. And everyone you speak to, their word becomes valid. And if you transcend that onto a stage, your performance then becomes valid because it's you. And it's that relationship. I love it. Ooh, I could not have said that any better. <laughs> Now, the thing that I kind of want to dive in a little bit further with you on that note is authenticity and vulnerability. Mm. So I think good podcasting when it's done right. And that's what I love about your show. And you even said it in the beginning of this episode. I do it for fun. You show up and you are Jean Paul. You know, you're not trying to be somebody else. You're just like, I'm doing this for fun because I'm making connections and I get to talk and share. So I think that as you, I think that's one of the mistakes I made early on as a podcaster is again, hiding up behind that stand, hiding up behind the wall or the microphone, thinking I had to be somebody else. And then eventually I let myself, you know, be more exposed in the sense of being vulnerable. So I think when I share, like I have shared Jean-Paul, some of the most like I don't get too weird, I promise, but sometimes I have shared some very intimate moments of my life with my listeners and it comes out authentically. I'm like, oh, look at that. Huh? How do I feel with that? And I'm totally okay. Cause the more that I'm like showcasing, like maybe a tear, you know, I've cried on the show before because we've talked about some really serious stuff when it comes to health or to, you know, the pandemic, things like that. When I've noticed that I've allowed myself to laugh, cry, you know, what, whatever emotion I'm conveying again, that's where that authenticity and vulnerability just shine. And then it makes it easier to air quote, cry through my music, to mourn what the composer is saying, to highlight and to get really excited through an, you know, through a dramatic passage. Right. So like, I think if a person listening to this is like, oh, I want a podcast at first, I don't know. I'm only speaking from my perspective. At first, you might feel like, ooh, those walls like Jean-Paul are talking about, they're there. But give yourself time and grace to let those melt away. And I give you, and I think I'm speaking for you too. I don't want to put words in your mouth. We're telling you like, allow yourself to be vulnerable and authentic because then that's when the magic happens. That's when you're going to start noticing those parallels and connecting to your musical voice on the stage in a very profound way. Here's a brief message from our friends at Song Flute Head Joints. The founder of the Song Flute Head Joint Company is young Chan Song, 
and he's had a remarkable career as a teacher before he began making head joints. He established his Korean company in 2009 because of his love for music and flute making. Later in 2010 and 2011, he learned more about the craft of making head joints from the Altus flute founder, Tanaka Suchi. After this instruction, Mr. Song furthered research the different kinds of metal alloys, especially how each alloy's difference changed the character and color of the sounds. Because of this training, Mr. Song's mission is to make a flute head joint that produces a beautiful sound with these metals and through his craftsmanship. In addition, he considers the flutist goals when purchasing a head joint, such as the tonal colors, response, and clarity. Not only do his head joints bring music to your ears, but they are aesthetically pleasing too. Musicians from across the globe adore the song flute head joint, such as Michel Morgus, Maxence Le Roux, Dr. Julie Kim Walker, and Jasmine Choi. And we hope you do as well. Mr. Song wants to assist you as you look for your next perfect head joint. Please visit their website at songflute.com to contact him today. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Being authentic. People, people, especially, it seems to be women, because guys, we, we tend to go through life and uh, we see other guys and we see other guys. And we, don't, we never sort of look, look at authenticity necessarily, unless it stares you in the face. But my my experience in my in my uh, getting older years, it it has been that there is and people can see and it's mostly women and I'm being very sexist here and I do apologise but in my experience women can smell authenticity they can smell genuine they can smell someone that is putting a show on and just like you go on the stage and you can see someone who is not themselves. Doing a podcast, you can feel and hear authenticity. And vulnerability is the most critical thing as a musician, that you are vulnerable. Because if you're not vulnerable, you're vulnerable, you become a robot. And if you become a robot, you have a sterile performance. Same with podcasting. Mm -hmm. If there's no vulnerability and there is no walk in that little fine line, it becomes, I think people switch off because there's no hook there. There is, it's almost scripted. And that's the great thing about podcasting is you don't script. And yeah. I'll give you a little story. The, a really interesting adjunct to the podcasting thing that I've been doing is that I recently found out my family tree because I thought with the name Jean-Paul, I was going down one route. I was told this by my mother. It turns out in my 59th year that that is not actually what happened. And my past is actually very very different so what I thought I would do is I would do a podcast that we didn't publish with my wife and we would then we would just sp speak about how we met 42 years ago all the fun things we've done and actually put stuff down on audio for the next generation so we're not going to tell anybody although my daughter probably listened to this but it is there in a dropbox all these little mini, they're what we call them mini podcasts, but little mini audio recordings of 15 minutes. And my wife, Jane, after we started doing this, she was quite shy to start with, and then she became a talker. And that is the key to everybody, is that you may think you don't have a voice, but you do. And it's just unlocking it. And that is what I believe you do when you teach people how to podcast. You can take this little person that is sort of sensitive and may even be introverted. And by the way, being introverted is a fabulous, a fabulous trait as it is. You don't have to be extrovert like me and you. Being an introvert is a valuable part of society. But I think what you do is you enable people to, to actually open their voice, but instead of pretending not to be that, just to develop like a flower. So they come to you as a little bud and you just slowly water them. And eventually, when they really get into their podcasts and you're guiding them through this, they flower. And then that flower goes on to create seeds. And then those seeds flower. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Well, first, 
I am humbled. Thank you so much for those very, very kind words. And that's another reason why I want to teach musicians how to podcast is because then you're right. They get to flower in their own entity as this beautiful organism. But then as they're putting out content and their perspectives and their expertise out into the world, the ripple effect is ginormous. And you think, oh, I got to have a little part of that. Now, like Tori Lupinek, she was one of my very first students. I love her to death. She's a flutist in Houston, and she started the Unclassical Musicians Mm -hmm. podcast, and she has flourished amazingly well. And because of it, she's come back to me and said, do you know the funny thing is as being a podcaster, I am more confident talking to the band directors I work with. I am more confident when I talk to my flute students' parents. When I'm in the flute studio and I have to articulate a concept, whether it's tone, articulation, whatever, I can nail it because I know what I want to say, how I want to say it. And she's just like, I feel like a warrior, you know? And then that information is affecting and impacting her tribe. And it's just so amazing to me. And that's why I love being an educator. It's just because I feel like, Knowledge is power, implementing knowledge into your life, making connections. I, sorry, quite frankly, I get a high off of that stuff. It is like mind blowing to me. So yes, you're right. The flowers then starts dispersing its own seeds. I love it. And people run away from a microphone. And I must admit, when I first sat down, and you you did ask me last week, when I started my first podcast, and I actually started it before it was actually trendy. And um, April the 15th, 2011, it was wow. re- very, really early. And wow. I just did sort of really silly uh, stories and put stories up. And the first one was about um, playing a straight su- a baritone saxophone. Of course, it doesn't exist, but it sort of trended a little bit. And people thought, I, mean, I got a lot, a lot of emails back from people saying, a straight baritone sax? I said, yeah, it's 25 foot long. And then we did one on uh, making 10 piccolo players play in tune. <laughs> and that was the second one on April the 22nd, 2011. And I was making lots of little things. And it was only, say, five years ago, four and a half years ago, when I thought, actually, I think podcasting is going to be the way forward. Mm. And I, I started it talking flutes with Claire rather than doing silly little things. And the microphone I used to run away from. But the microphone now has become my friend. I was more comfortable with a flute mouthpiece in front of my lips than the microphone. But the microphone now is, yeah, just talk. Mm. And whereas you can educate, my, my process is I sit in front of the microphone and just have fun. And, and that's great because you and I, we, everybody's different. Mm-hmm. I can't teach anyone how to podcast. I wouldn't know where to start mm. because I fell into it and I just sort of developed – and as I said to you, I bring people up at five o'clock in the morning and wake them up and <laughs> they'll come over and we'll go to a wine bar and I'll, we'll have a few sherbets and I'll record a podcast. And it is, there, there is my little vibe and hmm. it is what it is. Hmm. So if, if, and could I teach somebody how to do it? No. Hmm. I think it takes a dedication to be able to teach someone and to be able to condense each little chunk because podcasting is about hmm. chunks, isn't it? It's about finding yourself and then understanding how to record, how to edit, how to put out, and Mm. most importantly, understanding your voice, because Mm. that voice thing is so important, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. I mean, you can have all the right equipment, you can have all the right setup, but you're right. It's the art of podcasting. And a lot of times as a teacher, I mean, this is probably horrible of me, but It's the experiencing of podcasting where I just want to throw students in the deep end and be like, all right, you're baptized in fire, go. Because I mean, I can break it down and I have broken it down into like 12 lessons and things like that. And I can do that. And and I think that's vital when it comes to like the setup, the equipment, how to edit your own audio. If you don't have those skills in your wheelhouse, that needs to be broken down because there are actual tangible steps. But when it comes to the art of podcasting, like I, it's interesting you brought this up, Jean-Paul, because I've toyed with this. It's like, 
do I break that down or am I taking, I mean, I, I know we do this in some regards to music making, right? Like what are the, the aspects of making a really beautiful tone, you know, and practicing those harmonics and getting the colors in the sound. And then how do you teach that magical moment of being flutist on the stage? Do you know, it's hard, right? To break that down. Same with the art of podcasting. It's like, I have broken it down you know, and finding your voice, but at the same time, am I taken away from like them actually just getting their feet wet and being thrown in the deep end and then them learning from the experience itself? Am I making sense? Oh, you are. I'm very much for spontaneity. I think spontaneity gives a joy, gives an energy and a, a vibe. I just, I just wouldn't like to know that somebody's going to jump into podcasting and then scare themselves and think, oh, that's not very good. Oh, um, because you know, there is people that think they might have to write it all down. And then that becomes very much like rote, doesn't it? It becomes I am talking about this and I'm, I'm talking about flutes like this and this is how it is. And it's very sort of monotone. Mm -hmm. And I like spontaneity. And you're exactly right. So breaking podcasting down is only a necessity so that you know the basic equipment and mm -hmm. how to edit and finding the tools to edit and then just jumping straight in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think it's you know more than me you've taught more people I haven't taught anyone how to podcast I just I just get this thing out and talk yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and people either like it or they don't and there's nothing I can do about it be and yeah. I, you know to be perfectly honest I don't care yeah and because I don't take myself seriously uh yeah I I have a business that um I'm managing director of TJ Flute so I have a business that I run and that is very you know very successful and it's worldwide but I have to, and like musicians, you have to wear lots of different hats. Lots of, and we all wear lots of different yeah. hats, and we all have to wear lots of different heads. And if you're not used to being uh, in front of the stage, in, in front of an audience, you can always pretend to be somebody else and put a, sort of pretend to be Jimmy Galway or can pretend to be Dennis Buryakov on the stage, and then just go out there and be like them. And mm. same with podcasting, you can if if you're not happy with your voice, just talk and yeah. waffle like I do. <laughs> No, I love it. And to circle back to, again, the teaching of podcasting, you brought up something really interesting that I want to go down this rabbit hole with you for a little bit. And that is another reason why I want to teach this art and, and bring people into this medium is because of what happened with the pandemic. Our in-person opportunities shut down or were put on hold, right? And as one of what, six flute podcasters out there, I mean, we have two in the room right now and there's like four or five more out there. I was realizing for my own career and I would, I'm kind of curious and I want to ask you about opportunities for you and the Trevor James company. But for me, I was noticing that podcasting was this untapped market. Why were there only five or six flute podcasters out there putting out current content? I wanted to hear more voices. But not only that, for my career, I was given Jean-Paul, and I'm very blessed and humbled to say this, I was given so many phenomenal creative and financial opportunities because of Flute360 that I know in my heart of hearts, I would have never been able to been given those opportunities if it was not for the podcast. And that's what I want for musicians. I mean, I'm saying this with so much humility. I am not boasting in any way. I have been able to work with Kathy Blocky on 10, 15 different projects. She's hired my husband to do audio work for her latest flute zoo book and CD. I've worked with Robert Dick, Patricia Sermon, BG France. They just printed this beautiful logo of Flute 360 on a cloth for me. Do you know what I mean? I'm telling y'all, like, I am just, just <laughs> talking about confidence, right? I'm just a flute teacher in Dallas, Texas who happened to turn on a microphone. And I was blessed to have these people in my world, in my orbit, give me these opportunities that would not have been feasible just in my own little corner of the globe. So I'm curious to know what doors it has opened for you and for either the company, Trevor James, or for your specific individual career. But that's why I'm like, come over here, come over here. Because the pandemic, a lot of 360ers were saying, and again, I'm, I can be guilty of this in other past seasons, 
you know, saying like, where are the opportunities? My doors aren't opening. So what I'm saying is like, if you build your door, which is the podcast, build your own door, because then you're putting yourself out there. You're seeking, you're pulling people in. And now you're not just a flute teacher in Dallas, Texas, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's beautiful. But if you are wanting opportunities, then at some point, and I think you would agree with me on some level here, you have to put yourself out there and the podcast can highlight you. It can amplify your voice. It can shine this huge, you know, stage light onto your being and your expertise and what you bring out into the world through an international stage, not just a little regional area, but like regional, national and international. So I just want I want opportunities for people when, when they're finding maybe they're at their threshold or a crossroads in their career of like, what gives none of these doors are opening. So I say, build a door. Oh, I would wholeheartedly support that. I think for me, when I started the podcasting, it was purely a bit of fun and it was never intended to be anything but fun. I was started being approached two and a half years ago by companies who wanted to, when they saw the analytics, they wanted to sponsor segments of the podcast. And it got me thinking, do I really want to monetize it via, and by the way, monetization is important and you should know that there is a monetization aspect. If you want to actually create podcasts and there is good numbers, you will have people that will pay you to advertise on your podcast. And I'm sure Heidi, you'll speak about that in a minute. But I just thought, as it was never set up by me as a business, it was set up by just for a bit of fun. I I thought I will link my business into it. Mm -hmm. So I do an in indent and an out dent. And I just say this podcast is kindly sponsored by Trevor James Flutes. What does that give us? Well, I suppose... uh, yeah, the bottom line, we're reaching a lot of people at the beginning with the brand name and at the end with the brand name. Yep. And whoever sponsors your podcast, that's all they want to know is they want to have visibility. Yep. But if I wanted to take it down a different route, there is a lot more areas that you can speak to. There are lots of companies, there are lots of brands that want to get involved. And don't just think it's you speaking into a microphone and nothing else comes of it. If you want something to come for it, and you are active, and you go after the brands and say, look, there's a synergy here. I'm doing something on, on energy bars this, this week in a podcast. What, what do you feel about sponsoring it? Um, oh, I'm doing something on exercise and going to a brand. As long as you are proactive, then good things will happen to you. Yes, being proactive. I couldn't agree more. And speaking of brands and companies wanting to tap in to get that visibility through your show, because essentially they're wanting to tap and start building that awareness with your listeners about their Mm -hmm. brand, right? So I actually teach this too about corporate sponsorships. The thing that a lot of people get confused when I say, hey, like you can monetize through your podcast, people often, and no fault of their own, but they often think like, I'm doing it because I want to monetize. And that's my sole purpose. I'm like, no, I'm just being strategic and smart. If I'm going to do this, my main goal is always to serve my listener with valuable content, to build relationships because we cannot do it alone. I love people. I love serving people. And then if a brand approaches me saying, hey, guess what? I think we would be a good fit and I can find the win-win and it doesn't take away from my primary goal then I'm okay with that because, you know, well, like brand alignment. So the thing that I promote is if I start going to my 360 listeners and saying, Hey, you know, check out this doggy chow company. It's going to feel a little, I mean, most of my 360 listeners are pet lovers. It could be okay. If it's something that doesn't resonate with them and it doesn't help them, then they could start getting a bad taste in their mouth. Like, Ooh, Heidi's just out there for a check, you know? So any corporate sponsor that I bring on to 360, it's because it's a resource that I use. It's helped me. And I know like, Oh, I know my 360 listeners pain points. So a lot of my listeners are music teachers and they have said, you know, in the past, like, Oh man, the admin tasks of 
creating invoices and scheduling out things is really daunting. Then I'll say, hey, like there's this thing called Fonz, go check it out. Do you know what I mean? So I bring those companies in when I know like, oh, their product service or offering actually is going to help my listener. So I think there's this fine line of just integrity of just knowing like, am I serving my people or am I just, you know, kind of seeing money signs, <laughs> shiny oh, object syndrome? No, absolutely. It's integrity and content and making or designing your podcast to be only for the audience and then if something else aligns with it that's great I think with me it is people have said to me why do you have you know, Jimmy Galway or Jasmine Choi or lots of other people on it because they don't pay TJ and I said well that's not the point hmm. I come from I'm, I have a very weird philosophy in flute brands in that no one can tell you that you have to play this one no one can tell you this is the best each flute, black, each flute is unique to each individual person. So if somebody picks up a Powell, a Senkyo, a Brannon, a Muramatsu, uh, a Miyazawa, an Alta, she just keep on going on and mm -hmm. they don't align with it, that's fine with me. Mm -hmm. But if they go and pick up uh, a, a really an old flute, a Louis Lott or something, and it just sings, then great. And I, I, I regard that with TJ. And that's why we don't speak about TJ on the podcast, TJ Flutes, is huh. because TJ, if you if you pick up TJ and you like it, great. If you don't, you and you and you don't like it because the instrument doesn't resonate with you as an individual, that's fantastic because hmm. you know why a flute is resonating with you. Hmm. So it it is purely, I I include TJ as an indent and an outdent, just purely for product awareness, not for anything else. And I will say to everybody out there, if you're ever told to go and buy a certain flute by anybody, I think they're doing you a disservice. You have to go, they can give you a selection, they can give you guidance, but you have to gel. You spend more time with that tube, that sideways <laughs> blowing tube, than you do with your partner. So you've really got to <laughs> fall in love with it. <laughs> oh, shoot. I love it. You know what? That's very interesting. I feel a little doinky over here, not connecting the fact that you have various artists from different flute makers on the show. You're right. Jasmine Choi is Straubinger. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it brings me. Head, yeah. 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 It brings me to this memory of um, Haynes Flutes. The William S. Haynes Flute Company invited me to be in their booth in the 2019 NFA Exhibitor Hall. And it was really interesting because I had a live session recording going on in the festival. This was right before the pandemic. And I'm glad that that was an opportunity presented to me because I learned so much. And it was really interesting to see flutists walk by who wanted to like promote their class or talk about a topic that they were super passionate about, but they would stop and they would kind of pull me aside and whisper in my ear and they would go, I'm not a Haynes artist. Am I allowed to be in this space? <laughs> and I was like, yes, <laughs> of course. But I can see that mentality of like only Haynes or only Trevor James. And that's like you said, I love what you said. Like, this is your, you know, music lover, right? You're spending more time with this too than you are with your partner. And so whether it is Trevor James or Haynes or Yamaha or whatever it is, you have to find the right tube um, for you and your voice. And I was very blessed, you know, to work with uh, Christina and Katie who were working at Haynes at the time. And they were like, yes, everybody, everybody, you don't have to necessarily buy a Haynes flute. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear your stories, your expertise, what you have to offer. Come come in. And I love that invitation and how welcoming of an environment that space was. And that circles back to what you just said. I love that mentality that you have for the podcast and you're a Straubinger artist. Come on by. You're a pal. Come on by. I think hats off to you. And that, that then goes back to what we're talking about, inviting new people and imploring our listeners to start podcasting is because you just need that one email. You send an email to us, you send an email to Yamaha, you send an email to any other flute company and say, I'd love to do a podcast about you. The companies must be mad to say no because 
brands want to be out there. Yep. And this is the most cost effective way for any brand to get their message out. So yep. don't worry about sending an email, a speculative email. And you don't, it doesn't have to be the flute world. You can go into the clarinet world. You can go into the oboe world. Oh, that's an endangered species, so you probably <laughs> won't get very far. But you can go in any world. And when that email plops on somebody's desk and said, we'd love to interview you for a podcast, nobody is going to say no because it doesn't cost them anything. Nope. And B, it's going to an audience. And that audience is monetized. Even if it isn't physically monetized, the company or the brand will have a value on that. And that yes. is where podcasting is brilliant, is that everybody wants a slice of it. Yes. Yes. I couldn't agree more. And you're right. They would be mad to say no. Of the 200 episodes that I have produced, I think I have received two no's the entire four years. And it was only because their concert series was crazy off the charts and they were super, super busy. It was like- I had, a, I had a no from Elon Musk. Oh, <laughs> Well, why not? You have to, yeah. you just have to, you bite the bullet. You just email, you message people, yep. direct message them on social media. Just do it and just be funny. Just yeah. send them something, you know. And I think I, I probably sent him a picture of an omelet and said, I'd love to do a podcast with you. <laughs> you, know, you know, just do something that is different. Don't make, huh. just don't approach them in a very, hello, I am Sally. I am making a podcast called Clarinet Today. Yeah. And I would like to do a podcast with you because that won't excite the person that is reading the message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. And it goes back to what you were saying earlier about being proactive. Send the email. The worst mm -hmm. that can happen is you get a no. But guess what? The world still spins. Absolutely. <laughs> the sun will come up the next day. Oh. And that's the thing. I don't have to remind myself that anymore because I think with success, like, failure, well, not failure, but like getting those rejections and getting those no's is just inevitable. For every yes that I get, I get, you know, that many mm. more no's. So I welcome the no's. It's like, okay. And sometimes those no's, and I'm sure you agree with this, those no's aren't always permanent. A mm. lot of times people will circle back and say, oh my goodness, I was so busy during that season. I couldn't help you. I didn't have the time, but I would love to collaborate with you now. And then it's like, boom, yes, let's go. So a lot of my no's actually turn into yeses, probably kid you not, years later, years later. So you never know until you send out that email. And everybody should do it. I mean, we, 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 we go back to the whole premise of this is we, we, we have two podcasts here. We have Flute 360 and we have Talking Flutes. And we're both telling people, Come into this space. There is only six. Come on. How many millions of flute players out there? And it's not just flute players. Just enter this space. Have some fun. Yeah. Have some fun. Let us know what you're doing and we will push it because your voice is unique. How you speak is unique. How you like to have fun, how, how you like to do things are unique. And, yes, we have similarities with our podcast, but they're and it, it, because we're different people, yeah. they're very different. Yeah. And the more, the merrier. Yeah. And I don't want to toot my horn. I'm going to toot Jean-Paul's horn. If okay. you're listening to you, <laughs> you're like, I'm going to start blushing. Notice what he's saying right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm funny myself. For those Notice what he's saying. Notice what I'm saying. We could be like, oh, we're two of the six. Nobody enter. This is our space. We want to be exclusive. It's only for the so-and-so it's the opposite. It's completely, you know, 180. We're saying there's not enough flutists talking and sharing their voices and perspectives. We want you to have this space with us. We want you to have your own space. Shoot. Your podcast could be blowing it up even more so than Trevor James and flutes 360. You know, maybe you have a unique take that we're not offering right now. Right. And so I think it's really crucial that I highlight, like, listen to what Jean-Paul is saying. We're not pushing people away. 
we're welcoming people with open arms. We are because I, can, I learn so much by listening to other people. Whatever the age, just listening to them talk about their passion for finding a new flute. How did you find that new flute? Or talking about their teacher or talking about their impending DMA recital or their undergrad recital. I learned so much. But you have to speak to somebody to find out that. Put it out there on a podcast and the whole world can hear it. Why not? Because once you stick that message out, that voice is there forever. So your voice is in this sphere forever. Yeah. You're leaving a legacy. Yeah. And why not? What what we're scared of? Yeah. (laughs) We only have (laughs) one life. And if you want to share something, if you want to put it out there, because you think you have a unique perspective, do it. Because life is too short. I mean, I can't tell you how many of the 200 episodes I am almost positive. I have made a fool of myself. But I honestly, I'm at a point where I'm just like, I don't care. I had fun. We shared valuable information and I'm learning as I go. Publish. We could talk a whole nother hour. (laughs) I'm sure about, you know, this very topic, but you said it so well, your voice matters and we want you to be included in this space. And believe you can do it. And whether you think you have something valuable to say or not, I promise you, you do. Every single person on this planet has something valuable to say because we're not all clones. I have twins and, okay, they're boy and girl twins, but they are so very, very different and they both have their own individual unique voices. And you do too, whether you're a quiet person or a loud, noisy person like me. I think it's a case of just getting that microphone and just talking Hmm. and not being, just not being worried about what comes out. Hmm. And if you, even if you're practicing for a couple of weeks, just talking to it, I think you'll suddenly start to realize and it becomes more fluid and you, and you understand that you do have something to say. Hmm. And it may be, if you and I have to talk about a Mozart flute concerto, we'd come in at probably various, various different levels because we, there, there is no right or wrong. There's a preference. Hmm. And same with all music, there's right and wrong. There's a preference. Same with podcasting. There isn't a right or wrong. There's a yep. preference. Yep. Podcasting is extremely flexible. You can be as creative as you want to be. I love how Amy Porter has snippets of her playing Mm. in the opening and the midsection and the closing of her playing. I think that's fantastic. I want to do, actually, I want to start copying that and start doing that more through 360. I would love to see somebody doing like the performance guides that were so popular in the flute talk magazines, Mm -hmm. but through oral means. How cool would it be to talk about like the A section of the sonata of some flute sonata? And instead of just having like the physical, like excerpt of the manuscript printed, but to then actually demonstrate what you are trying to portray about accents or intonation or whatever topic that you want to communicate, then you get to play it through your flute. So you can say measures one through 10 of blah, 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 right? And then demonstrate your point through not only your spoken voice, but through the flute. I think that would have such a profound impact on a listener and especially like a student who's, you know, learning as supplemental information as they're going to the university or the college. I I just think that there's so much flexibility in podcasting. Like it could be a performance guide. It could be showcasing newly commissioned works that are being added to our flute canon, you know, and so many more options. I mean, there's so many flute choirs around. Why doesn't each flute choir have a podcast? And they can, yes. <laughs> you know, about band rehearsal, about this next concert and recording the concert and playing it through the podcast. There's marching bands. Why isn't there the flute sections have podcasts Ooh. that are talking about the, going to band camp? And there's so many opportunities that people just don't seem to notice. And they're, oh, they go, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. There is so many. Just break free of the shackles and just do it. Ooh, I love it. We just gave y'all like 20, 30 ideas. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, shoot. Well, Jean-Paul, I think we need to wrap up this phenomenal conversation, but I so admire you. I respect what you're doing. Thank you for being in this space with me. I have learned so much and 
I cannot thank you enough. I well, I'm going red again. And uh, ditto, ditto. I am. I I admire what you're doing, but more importantly, the fact that you also are pushing people to create their own podcasts. And you do it more than me because I just switch to say I switch the button on, I talk, I switch off, and I go live. You actively, with all your efforts, encourage others to enter this space. And I think that is one of the singly most important things uh, that you are doing, which is developing people's voice. And we go back to where we started. It's all about the voice. And you have a vocal voice, which you're speaking into the microphone, and then that transcends into your performance. And as we've quite nicely sort of segued, both complement each other. And, you know, thank you for bringing that to the world with Flutes 360. Talking Flutes does things totally different, but... That's the fun of it. So don't try and copy, just be yourself. Yes, thank you. And thank you. Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 podcast. Please go to HeidiKBegay.com slash contact and let's connect. If you need guidance in terms of your musical career, please do not hesitate to reach out. I have been helping musicians for years navigate their careers and I would love to help you do the same. Let me help you find your unique voice on and off the stage today. Schedule a 15-minute discovery call to see how I can help you. Please go to HeidiKBegay.com slash contact or Calendly.com slash HeidiKBegay and let's talk. The links are in the show notes below. Talk to you soon. Let's talk about flute.